Hey, a folk studio here with the first LEGO Studio mailbag. Let's go ahead and just jump right in. How do pro players deal with loss? I notice when I practice with my team and we lose, it's very hard to find motivation to keep going. How do you slash other pro players get over this? Uh, how I get over this tends to be if I'm losing in normals, well, they're normals, I'm having fun, I can stop playing. It's not a big issue for me. If it's uh, solo queue, kind of the same thing. I just back off. But I'm also playing a lot less consistently than some of the pro players. I, I tend to be more analysis, be looking more at the games that are being played afterwards than playing myself. Though I, I do need to play more. How do pro players, how do you know the TSM, CLGs of the world deal with their own losses? Well, that's a good question and unfortunately it doesn't have a good answer. Every team will deal with it differently. Uh, to use Star Captain as an example, I can't think of specific players off the top of my head, but this happens somewhat often. There'll be a player who, if they lose the first game out of best of three, they have a 90% chance of losing that best of three. Now, it's not because they're a bad player, they're some of the best players in the world, but they're so emotionally on tilt when they get to game two and game three, they just cannot compete on the same level. And that tends to be what happens a lot for League of Legends teams. Uh, I'm not going to call anybody out in particular for this just because I peeled around the corner and I don't want to be the guy who's just like, yeah, this is how you beat one team. You just go ahead, beat them game one, just use your gimmick then, and they'll just be so on tilt you'll win game two, game three. No, I'm not going to do that. But uh, I can use some history. So TSM, they, their examples tend to be we lose, we recover, we get stronger. That, that's been their motto for a while. They lost really badly at IEM Hanover. Uh, they looked inward, they said, what are the problems, what's going on, what's wrong with our team, ended up replacing Rain Man for Dyrus, and they dominated North America for a few months. Some teams, when they lose, they keep losing. And, I don't know, there's a lot of different perspectives. If it's the heat of the moment, I'd say it is a really big problem for teams in North America to lose motivation, to lose their stride, their stride, and they just, they roll over dead. A lot of teams do this. I, I'm not going to name names, but... Uh... I've seen some tournaments with face cams, and you you can see just the fear and the lack of confidence in the players. And when that happens, well, they've rolled over dead. Uh, other teams, they kind of say, it happened, get over it, move on. But the truth is, in North America, a lot of people just don't deal with their problems when it comes to losing, and they just lose some more afterwards. Um, the best way to deal with loss tends to be look inward, say, what happened wrong? And when you can pinpoint what happened wrong, not ne not the people who messed up but what happened overall wrong then it's a lot easier to move forward just be like all right these were our mistakes we cannot make them again play better play stronger um if you don't have time to do that or if people are too grumpy then there's other outlying problems that are affecting your gameplay hey studio you're sexy too thanks Anyway, I want to know what's your thoughts on the new champ Zed. Many people say he does no damage. I have not played him yet because I'm having second guesses of whether I should buy him or not. Uh, Zed owns, but he's incredibly difficult to play. Like He's one of the hardest champions I've seen to play just because his range on his uh, skills are completely ass. Yeah, like, think of low range skills. Think of someone like Akali. She has someone to make up for that. You can dash in at a long distance. Zed does not have high gap closing in his skills. He's got really uh, good base move speed. But the problem Zed ha has is his damage is amazing. It's really good at killing someone like Ari, someone like Ezreal. If you can get, go ahead, close the distance, uh, get your ultimate on someone, then land a shuriken and his W, usually with some auto attacks, that's enough for a kill. Possibly an ignite too, depending on your farm. The problem he has is he can't lane top lane because the bruisers just kick his ass. He can't lane uh, in the jungle. Well, not really lane, but you can't jungle because he doesn't really have good... Like, he has okay ganks. They're like bad Skarner ganks. And he doesn't have good sustain, so he doesn't have good jungling. Like, he doesn't do enough in the jungle. He, he's not strong enough in any specific area there. Mid lane, he's pretty viable. I, I'd say you, you can put him in lane. He can be effective there. But if you don't have a decent front line to distract the enemy team when you go in, if you are trying to run up to the carry and they escape, like, you have to make sure you get to people, and that can be so hard. But when you land your skills, when you do your damage, he is insane. He is completely nuts. But you have to have the farm, you have to get to people. It, I would recommend, if you really want to put in the time to learn a character, Zed is a very good character for that, because he is hard to play, but when you do play him well, you can get a lot done with him. 
Ever since Froggen showed off Lee Sin at MLG and the Lone Star Clash, I've seen a lot of people to start uh, start using it in other Bruiser mid styles. How does a, a typical frail mid laner, usually for me it's Arya Morgana, deal with a hyper aggressive Bruiser mid? I feel like I just get, keep getting pushed back and not being able to take the Bruiser and keep him from roaming and ganking. Um, well, Bruisers in mid lane have a very specific role. Kick your butt. Now, some characters can deal with this fairly well. Someone like Morgana, for example, once you get enough levels in Tormented Soil, you can start spamming that and just keep farming passively from a distance. However, you have to get to that point first, and a lot of what those bruises depend on is just kind of knocking you off tilt early on. But the truth is, you really can't beat most bruisers early on. Uh, with the backup of a, jung a jungle gank, you can shut them down usually if they go super aggressive level 1, level 2. A lot of people don't tend to do that because mid lane can be very weird to gank sometimes, and it's usually, usually you want to go for someone less mobile than the uh, bruisers because bruisers tend to have high base move speed. But the truth is, a good early jungle gank, because the bruisers have to go aggressive early on before you get that wave clear on some of those characters, tends to be really effective. Um, also buying some early armor and uh, mitigation, just like maybe a Dorn Shield if you want to mitigate it, isn't too bad. Overall though, when you give someone like Lee Sin a lot of farm, when you give those Bruisers mid a lot of farm, Bruisers don't tend to have the best team fight interaction. So Lee Sin, for example, is not a good team fight character. He's really good at bursting and assassinating somebody, but if you force early team fights against somebody like Morgana, you're, you're, you're gonna win those fights. You'll get a Morgana ultimate off onto three people, he can kill one person if they're not protected. At the same time though, it's really something that's being explored more and more, and I would recommend that if you really want to beat a Lee Sin mid, just play against a lot of Lee Sin's mid. Uh, I can give you general advice, you know, don't try to all in him, don't try to uh, trade with auto attacks. Like if he walks up to you, if you let him walk up to you, you're in a bad position with any AP. But he's going to be super aggressive and you're really going to win just because he's not that effective with farm later on. I don't know, it's it's a weird thing to say, because it's not that you necessarily beat him now, it's just that later on, as long as you haven't lost too severely, he just doesn't do as much. Uh, how do you deal with a team that is constantly roaming as 5? Well, roam as 5 yourselves, or split push. Uh, that's the easiest solution, you just gotta kinda put wards down, so when you do go for a split push, you're not just gonna get ganked, give the, the 5 guys a kill, and you can't defend a turret in response, but... Usually when you see an early grouping as 5 for something besides a quick dragon objective, um, you, you lose towers around the map. You start losing objectives, you start losing control, and it really punishes you. The The quick and dirty answer is, if they're roaming as 5, ward up, roam as 5 yourselves. If they're not roaming, if they're roaming as 5 and you can't beat them in a team fight, like you just don't have a team fight team, then ward up, split push, and just apply pressure across the map. If they go for objectives, if they push as five, uh, you know, maybe have one person try to hold it and try to wave clear, but across the map you should have people taking turrets and punish them for grouping as five. When you group as five, you are not getting as much CS because the other lanes are being pushed in, CS is dying there, they're not picking it up. And even though they can push down one turret faster, they can't react to you pushing down, let's say, two turrets in mid and bot lane. It's also, of course, you know, you have to know what you're doing it, you can't do it if they're going to take like inhibitor in response because then that trade is not worth it. Do you think any NA or European teams have chances against Korean and other foreign teams? Example, TPA. Yes and no. Europe does. Europe most certainly has a good chance against some of the foreign teams. Uh, Moscow 5 was not, I'd say, ready for TPA strengths. I did not think Moscow 5 really knew how strong TPA was for the finals. Uh, because no one knew how strong TPA was at Worlds. Everybody said the same thing, which is lately they've been kind of crappy in online tournaments, and they've been kind of crappy in online tournaments. That was the case. Now TPA showed that they're actually really good, and they're still really good. But uh, Moscow 5, I think if they come prepared, they definitely have a good shot at beating TPA. Uh, they're going to be playing IPL 5. Group D going to be one of the hypest matches ever. Uh, CLG has also shown they can deal with uh, some of the foreign teams. It's it's weird because a lot of it is the inexperience the teams have against each other. So it's like TSM plays CLG, they both know what they're going to do. They have good ideas of what the other side will be. If you're someone like Moscow 5 and you play TPA, when have you really seen TPA play? Mo TPA knows Moscow 5 wants to be aggressive and they're really good at team fighting and usually can stop the late game pretty well. But Moscow 5 didn't know TPA. Uh, same way, I'd say CLG and Frost had a good interaction, and that was a really good 
example of one team kind of studying the other at Worlds. Frost just completely trashed CLG. Um, aside from that, there hasn't been a good example since Worlds. Uh, MLG Palace did have Najin Sword and Blaze playing against CLG U, but at the same time, um, CLG U didn't have five people there. They had four in a sub, and they hadn't practiced at all, so that's not a good indicator. Now, can North American teams stand up to uh, foreign teams from Korea, from Asia, from really the dominant scenes? Yes and no. If they've improved, if they've gone inward, possibly. Uh, there are a lot of excuses as to why North America is not very good. One of them, uh, my favorite, is, well, North America, we uh, we don't get a practice against uh, really good teams. But I, I consider that excuse bullshit. I'm just going to say it's bullshit because, all right, we don't get a practice against good teams because we've never made any of our teams solid. Like, we don't make ourselves better. We just try to beat other North American teams. So while other teams will improve a lot in a very short amount of time because they're trying to focus on themselves, trying to improve inwards, the main focus in North America has been to beat the teams you play. And the, the teams we play aren't North American teams. But there, there, there is no reason why a team like uh, TSM couldn't be better, why a team like CLG couldn't take out an Asian team. And that's because, uh, well, why are they trying to improve just to beat North American teams? It, it's this weird thing where it's like, all right, eventually you will reach a point where the competition you play will be your sole determining factor in like how you improve. If you do not get enough new strategies, if you do not get enough new info coming in, you will not get better. But the teams in North America, they're at a point where I'd say they have to look at their own team, at their own lineups, at their own mistakes, figure out what's going wrong inward at the beginning, at the core, at the root of the teams, before they can really get as strong as someone like uh, Azubu Blaze, as strong as someone like TPA. And they can do it. They most certainly can. It's sometimes that might be a roster of players, but sometimes it might be just how they talk and how they play in-game. The words they say over something like team speak could be more devastating than a bad uh, mechanical skill. But at the same time, I, I don't know if they've done it. I don't know if they're moving in that direction. Like, it, it's weird to say this, but there, there's no reason we couldn't have the team as strong as Moscow 5. Moscow 5 came out of nowhere and kicked everybody's asses. They were not playing against the best teams. They, they just kind of did it. They just showed up and kicked everybody's butts. It was a very short amount of time. Is it because they were just better players? No, they they actually improved a lot. They were really good players, but it's because they, they thought differently. They thought smart, and they've they've always played as a team. They've always been five people. Like People always will say, like, oh my god, Alex Siege is so amazing. But then they'll say Genja's amazing, but then they'll say Gosu Pepper's amazing, and it just keeps going on. It, it goes to Darien, it goes to Diamond Prox, everybody's really good on that team, it's because they're playing as five, not as one. Studio, I love you, and I love you too. Why don't you post gameplay of yourself more often? Um, I get hypercritical on myself, I'm just like, this is a bad play, this is a bad play, this is a bad play, I'm the worst fucking player in North America, ah! But, um, well... You can't just be hypercritical. Uh, I'm actually trying to improve on that. I do like posting my own gameplay just because it is a different perspective. And it is nice to kind of look inward. Like, looking at my own mistakes and, being, and just talking about them is always fun. And I, I do play better after those videos. Like, at that specific character I was playing for sure. At the same time, though, I just need to make sure I don't just post myself and just get so grumpy. Um, I could post, like, normal games and just, you know, goofier games if people would like those. Uh, I do. I have been streaming a bit more. I need to stream some more often, or more often. But if I do that, I could start posting some of those games if you guys would like that. Do I follow competitive fighting games at all? Um, yes. And I like I, I, this question. I don't think it's super important to right now, but I, it's fun to talk about because fighting games and their culture have a very laid back style. The comment says like they don't like the term esports, but truth is. They could learn a lot from that. We could also learn a lot from the fighting game's perspective. League of Legends tends to be very binary. It's either a super competitive uh, game or a laid-back game. Like, there is no in-between. There is no transition in tournaments. And uh, fighting games at EVO, you tend to have, like, these really laid-back group stages. People are just kind of chatting and chilling and talking about the games going on. And then as you get closer and closer to the finals, closer to the uh, top 16, the commentary gets a lot more serious. It gets a lot more professional. And I, I really like that transition. At the same time, uh, fighting games, I think they could use a bit more, well, they gotten better about it, but like, uh, when they lack professionalism, it can scare off people like sponsors, scare off new viewers, but 
they've been catching themselves a lot. It's like they will they will be casual, but they will not veer to the offensive territory necessarily. What is my initial reaction to the season three item changes? Fuck. They're cool changes. They're really awesome, but they're they're gonna change the game dramatically. Everybody knows this. Like the game will not be the same after season three items have come out, and I'm okay with that. I'm very okay with that. But it's also scary because it's gonna be a new game. It's gonna be completely hectic. It. I would not be surprised if uh, because of the item changes, if all this comes up preseason, so that uh, season three final qualifiers term is played with new items and new all the new changes. That can be just completely insane. It will change the game, how it's played, and teams that don't adapt, teams that we all know and love, if they don't get ready for the changes and aren't ready for Season 3, then um, that's going to be pretty crazy. If we might see a lot of new blood show because of that. But um, that's going to be all for today. Hope you guys like this. I'll keep doing this because they're really fun. I'm, I'll post another video later asking for questions. Not going to be doing one this week though because uh, with IPL 5 coming up... Uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta be there. Gotta be ready for that. So, adios, folks. Hope you enjoyed this.